All right. Can you all see a presentation? Yes. Yes. Great. So before I even start, let me just uh, preface this with the caveat that this is all kind of a recent effort and really something, I mean, I've been aware of data package maybe for uh, the past year or so and frictionless uh, later on, um, but it's really only in the past couple months where I've started to flesh out these ideas more thoroughly and actually try to use them in uh, useful applications. So this is kind of my um, perspective on that experience and kind of thoughts on going forward and how this could potentially be useful in biology and uh, genomics. All right, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, the challenge or there are some challenges to kind of working with bioinformatics data and doing analysis at scale. So one of the big goals of biology and kind of bioinformatics is to be able to develop systems models of organisms, of cells, of tissues, and so on. Um, so far, the models generally fall short of what people kind of expected we would be able to do at this point in time. Um, part of this is probably just due to the fact that we're, we have incomplete data. Um, we have all kinds of biological assays, you know, to collect information on cellular states. <clears throat> um, but in all likelihood, there's a lot of things going on that we're just not capturing because we, we're not there yet. We don't understand it. Um, but another major issue is that the ability to kind of integrate data um, is severely lacking. So even in the like kind of largest scale um, studies that have been done uh, collecting biological data, um, so things like the TCGA, uh, which was kind of a pan-cancer multi-institute uh, experiment or that was performed over you know a decade or something, like that has thousands of uh, samples or observations essentially um, of different kind of tumor uh, data sets or tumor assays. But this is still way too small to really start to even build these kinds of models that we want to do. Um, the problem is basically that, you know, for uh, a typical human cell, um, you have something like 20,000 protein coding genes. And if you include other non-coding genes, it goes up to, you know, 60,000. So you can imagine that trying to model a system with 60,000 variables and only 1,000 observations is not going to work out so well. So one possible solution to get around this is to try to think about better ways to integrate data from different sources. Because there are you know, tens or hundreds of thousands, probably even millions at this point in, uh, in time of uh, data sets and samples collected um, of you know, human and other organisms. But the kind of the ecosystem out there right now is kind of a mess. So data, depending on where you get it from or who ran the experiment, um, it could be processed differently, include different types of metadata. Um, even the efforts like GEO, which is from uh, NIH and NCBI, it's a big kind of repository of gene expression data, which is one of the kind of important types of genomics data. Um, even their data is kind of a mess. Like they encourage users or require users to submit metadata, but there's no validation done on it. The kind of the quality of the metadata is hit or miss. And here's just like one example of a data set where someone, uh, these are kind of the metadata fields captured. And one of the interesting things that you'd like to know about the disease stage is actually encoded in the title of the sample. So you have to uh, like parse this out uh, manually, which is a pain. So yeah, those, those efforts aren't there yet either. Um, and a lot of these, you know, like GEO doesn't do anything to normalize the metadata. Um, so it makes it really challenging to do this at scale. So one of the things I've done over the past couple of years in the postdoc is trying to do this kind of data integration for a relatively small set of uh, experiments, um, 25 all from one type of cancer. And it basically just required a lot of manual processing of metadata and kind of finessing to get the data to work together. And in the end, it is really useful and we're able to learn a lot from it. Um, but that process should be much simpler and could be a lot simpler. So that's kind of the motivation. All right, so what my approach then and how I think data package could be useful and frictionless um, is to basically create a repository of actually clean bioinformatics data. So a lot of these uh, existing repositories, you know, try to clean up the data and they do help in some ways, but they still, uh, like I said, they're often missing this kind of 
normalization of fields and things like that that is essential to doing anything automated at scale. So what I thought I'd do is create uh, pipelines to build on top of these existing resources and try to go one step further and really get things to a very consistent format where it becomes much more trivial to then start to integrate data. Um, so I don't want to recreate the wheel. A lot of work has already been done. And it's also computationally intensive to work with some of the raw data. So my thought instead is to build on top of some existing uh, semi-clean data products and resources. Um, the focus then would be on the downstream data products. So instead of working with the raw sequence data, which is you know gigabytes or terabytes, I'd work with um, the kind of count tables and matrices that have been generated on top of those. Um, and kind of one of my thoughts in how I want to approach this personally and how I think it could be useful is basically prioritize consistency and transparency over perfection. <clears throat> so if someone is actually a scientist working in the field and they're an expert on some type of data, then they might have a very specific way they would want to process the data and they want to kind of go over it with a fine comb. And that's perfectly fine, but it's not practical to do that um, for a large number of data sets and for a large kind of variety of different types of data. And so my belief is that, you know, instead of trying to do things perfectly and painstakingly every time, is let's try to do it good enough. So basically make some reasonable decisions about how data could be kind of normalized, cleaned up, filtered, and how to kind of prepare the metadata. Um, and then just document exactly what was done and put the code online along with it. So people, if they're really interested in understanding how the data has been transformed, they can go back and see that. Um, but instead, I'd rather just, yeah, kind of make some of these decisions knowing that, you know, there's some kind of trade-offs along the way. But the benefit would be that we could then get the data much more quickly into a useful state and still, I believe, preserve most of the important signal and information. Okay. Um, and yeah, like I said, a big part of this will just be building on top of other efforts that already kind of get us part of the way there. Um, I also think that ontologies could be useful to help ensure kind of precision in terminology in the metadata. And so there are a few, I mean, there's a lot of different ones used in biology in general, but these are a few I think are particularly useful for kind of bioinformatics and data analysis pipelines and so on. Um, and I'm also interested in kind of capturing data provenance information. So I'll give you an example in a moment of how I'm doing this already and how I'm thinking about doing it in the long run. Um, but basically, you know, if you have some data that's in a data package and then you, I perform some analysis on it in a pipeline and generate a new derived data set, it would be useful and not all that difficult to capture the information about the kind of original source data and what steps were taken in the derived data set metadata. Uh, and yeah, and ultimately you could imagine that if you have some raw, rawish or let's say clean data that starts and then you process in one way and then perform analysis, it wouldn't be that hard then have a whole lineage captured in the metadata. Um, so someone could clearly see what has been done. Um, yep, and ontologies are also useful here because even the things like data transformations and analyses can sometimes be captured in these ontologies. Uh, okay, so I won't go through all this. This is probably yeah, more than you need to know, but this is the basic idea of how I'm approaching it so far. Um, so we have the raw data sources and what I'm calling right now just kind of data recipes. And this is basically my manual steps where I'm taking data from sources, looking at what needs to be done to get it in a kind of semi-clean state and kind of doing a light level of processing there. Um, and for the next step is I have a pipeline called Data Packager, which I can show you. Um, it's written right now in SnakeMake, which is a computational kind of pipeline framework commonly used in bioinformatics. Uh, it's kind of modeled after Makefile and allows you to mix R, Python, and other languages if you want to. And it's just a kind of nice quick way to build up pipelines. Um, but yeah, so I have a data packaging pipeline that basically takes these clean data, uses some YAML metadata that I uh, describe each of the source data sets with, um, and then generates actual data packages. Um, and so that becomes a separate repository. And then from there, I can start to feed these into bioinformatics pipelines that I've developed to do different useful things. Um, and each, what I've done, so some of these um, 
I already had in the past uh, to do these kinds of analyses. But what I've done in the past few weeks, in the past month, is to start to basically modify the existing pipelines I have to both ingest and generate uh, data packages and also to start to capture some of this provenance information. And I mean, uh, the long-term goal is, yeah, to just have data that's much more consistent and could be easily integrated. A lot of what I, kind of my research interests in the long run and where I think we could benefit a lot from are, as I mentioned before, integrating large numbers of data sets. Um, but there's also kind of other useful things like by using data package, it becomes much simpler to write kind of generalized data visualization and data exploration tools. And I think that could be really useful. Um, okay, so- Just, 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 just a co can I ask some comments? So do sure you thing. know about the, um, there's a kind of view, there's a very basic kind of like spec for kind of adding views to data sets that no. isn't like trying to invent the wheel, but it's just, so, so, so obviously there's, there's stuff like, um, um, I'm having a complete mind blank suddenly. There's there's a spec, a JSON spec. I've just forgotten its name. Oh my god. Not JSON schema. I mean that's no no for, for describing visualizations. For describing ah. visualization. Uh, okay. Called, it's called Vega. Um and but there's also oh, this, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I have seen that. That's like right, uh right. But, but so we're not trying plot, to, right? Yeah, well it, it's it's yeah, but it's, we're not trying to replace it, but what you need is some kind of binding between the data set and whatever your you, like, you, you need something that just says in your data package, hey, I've got this visualization and it uses the Vega grammar as a way of describing the visualization. So this tool can plug in, but you need some bridge. That's a really great idea. I think exactly, I, I mean, this is moved by it. Sorry, let's yeah. come to your thoughts. Come to your thoughts and next steps kind of question. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, I appreciate it. That's a, uh, so I've seen, I've come across that before, but I haven't actually looked into it recently or thought about it in this kind of context. Um, yeah, and there's also, there's also stuff in Frictionless to do the views work, which is, what I mean is that it's, there's nothing just to say how to specify in a data package that this like, like oh, I want a section which is describing visualizations and it uses, let's say, Vega to do, to describe the visualization. But it's just like that, that small pit of glue is done in, 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 in the Frictionless specs. Anyway, okay. onwards. Cool. This is I'll brilliant. I'll look into that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, whoops, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's not animated, sorry. Let's try that again. Um, all right, all at once. So <laughs> overall, like the experience has been quite positive, I would say like, I mean, all these kind of pipelines or the adaptations I was talking about just now, I was able to do in the matter of, you know, weeks or days uh, after an afternoon sometimes to adapt things. I can show you real quick. Uh, so this is all local, but I mean, so this is uh, just a small example of some of the data packages that I'm generating for different public and kind of personal research projects. Um, and the pipeline to do that is here. Um, but this is where, so I mentioned how the very first step to packaging things, I have some kind of metadata that describe the different data sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so here's just one example of that. Uh, so this is PharmacoGX is a, a resource that attempts to bring together uh, different kind of drug screen data sets. Um, and so some of these efforts like CCLE is another one that's like a multi-year or multi-institution, like, you know, five, 10 year project and stuff. So they're just, they're, going part of the way to normalizing some of these data sets and making it easier to work with. And I'm just basically going one step further and building on top of them. But then by defining this kind of basic metadata and doing this consistently with other data sets, then you can imagine how it's not yeah. that hard to go from this to a data package. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, it's worked out really well overall and I'm quite happy. Um, so one thing is genomics data tends to differ from other kind of data that I think is typically probably targeted or thought of for the frictionless uh, specs. So a lot of genomics data is uh, numeric matrix. You know, it's kind of assessments of some gene uh, in some patient or cell line. Uh, and so you might typically these would be something like 60,000 rows and between 10 and 1,000 columns. 
Um, and that's the other thing is, so the data is often, it's inverted from how most other fields and kind of people work with data. So usually one would have the observations of this, as the rows and your variables or features in the columns. Um, because we have this kind of problem of big P and small n, where we have many more variables, um, just historically, biologists tend to flip this. Um, and it kind of makes sense, right? Like if you had 60,000 columns in 10 rows, it would be a pain to work in Excel or Vim or whatever you're working in. Um, but that also just means that, yeah, like what you think of as fields are actually our observations and vice versa. Um, so this could be something that one might consider incorporating into the specs in the future, some way to indicate uh, that orientation um, if, if it's important to differentiate, you know, fields from observations. Yeah, Keith, um, we've, we've had that discussion before with some yeah, yeah. As, as well. And I can't remember if I sent you that link, but you did. Right, yeah, oh, okay. I was going to say right now the the plan is to not change it, but I think it's important to hear that it would be helpful for you again, because that is something that <laughs> maybe we could consider adding in in so, the future. I mean, to be honest, I'm not even sure if it is essential at this point. Like I haven't hit any roadblocks due to this. Um, and just, I think, just having a standard that is well thought out and I can follow for kind of describing the data and you know, generating data products is already most of the challenge, I think, or a big part of the problem. You know, whether if there's like a large number of fields described in the data package metadata because of how many observations there are or whatever, uh, that's not the end of the world. And, you know, I think if it's processed automated anyway, uh, it won't be a big challenge. Um, if you, if we ultimately, I think it could be interesting or worthwhile to maybe consider, you know, genomics or bioinformatics uh, specific uh, specs, in which case perhaps this could be something considered there. Um, but that's ultimately up to the, you guys too and what your desired scope is and how you are, how you think about this kind of specialization of different data types. Like I know you have some now for financial data and I think a couple other data types. Um, so perhaps that could be one route to go for dealing with uh, genomics data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, so this is kind of a side note or observation, but uh, what I've been doing and I think is kind of interesting and other people might consider is um, it's not that hard if you're already processing data to compute some summary statistics. Um, so just, you know, mean, median, range, kurtosis, yeah, whatever yeah, along. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Embed that in the metadata. And then you could imagine basically very quickly reading in the metadata and then generating useful plots and summaries yes, um, yes. without having to do any computation on the fly. Yes. Uh, so something, yeah. And I mean, you could also imagine even embedding like uh, base 64 encoded plots if you wanted to, although I'm not sure if that's the best use. Just uh, something else I've considered. Uh, long term, uh, yeah, I think it could be useful or interesting to at least explore developing some biology specific specs to deal with these kind of uh, quirks of how the data are formatted and whatnot. Um, something I've also been thinking about is how to kind of hierarchically define or organize the data models um, because, you know, there is. Generally, you know, mixed data all tends to follow this convention, but then there are different types depending on the assay. Um, so one could imagine defining one kind of master spec and then either having subspecs for different data types or possibly just defining specific terminology to use in the metadata to delineate which is which. Um, so the next step for me personally, so most of this I've been doing kind of on my own at this point, just to make, to get a sense for how feasible it is in the long run. Um, and after I've done just a little more work on the kind of prototype pipelines and maybe have the chance to put together a web interface to actually explore the results, I'll probably, uh, my, or my plan rather, is to reach out to some other people I've worked with over the years in the kind of bioinformatics community and get feedback from them and kind of see what things are, maybe problems that I haven't thought of already and how they think we can move things forward. And then longer, longer term, I'll have to figure out how to pay for this. So right now, like, it's free and easy to sh write code and share that. And that's already probably could be helpful for some. But it would be really useful to be able to have an actual data repository where people could go 
and click a link to download a data package for data X, Y, and Z. Um, but that's something I'll have to, yeah, again, find a way to fund. And do you know that data? Hub, do you know that data hub IO exists? Which is the I yeah. I have seen it. Um, I haven't. So is that hosted and funded by you all? And yeah, that's hosted and funded by Datopia the present. Um, I can go a little bit, but you're aware of it. We can go at it in more deep depth, but that's a great, just to check. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, that, actually that was one of the inspirations for me moving forward on this project. Like I liked how clean and nice the interface was and I could have <laughs> see how lacking that is in bioinformatics and how useful it would be if we had something like that. So long term, that's kind of the direction I wanted to go in anyway. But I hadn't really considered that um, yet. Uh, so that's maybe something worth looking into more ser seriously. Thank you.